Welcome back to chapter 16, and this is the last video that focuses specifically on our sun. And we're going to talk a little bit about how astronomers are able to know what the sun looks like on the inside, because we can't take pictures of it. So the sun has an extremely high mass, which means that the force of gravity that's constantly trying to pull the sun inward is huge. If there was nothing to combat that force of gravity, then the inward pull of gravity would collapse the whole entire sun into a black hole, and that won't happen. The sun is extremely stable right now, and even at the end of its life, it will not make a black hole, and we'll talk about in chapters 23 and 24 why that is. But right now, the reason the sun is so stable is because for the amount of inward pull of gravity, there is an equal and opposite amount of outward push of pressure, gas pressure from the high temperatures of the sun, because the sun is making energy at all points in time. This balance between pressure and gravity is extremely important, not just for the sun, but for all stars, and it is called hydrostatic equilibrium. That is a very long term, and it's one of the longest terms that we act actively need in our vocabulary. We should write it down now because it will become extremely important as we talk about how stars live and how stars die. So right now the sun is stable and all stars during most of their lifetimes are stable because the inward pull of gravity balances the outward pull of pressure. And it's a very important and delicate balance. Now, what that means though, is that the sun has to be constantly producing light and heat to keep that pressure very high. This set of diagrams from the textbook shows us that for the teal colored, leftmost colored portion here, what we would consider the core of the sun, the temperature is extremely high, the density is extremely high. On the far left, that's what those two diagrams are indicating. On the upper right diagram, fraction of luminosity means the rate at which energy is being generated. And we see that energy is only being generated in the inner 20% of the sun. 0.2 means 20% of the sun's size. So the sun is making all of its energy in its core, and then that energy moves outwards through, we see diagrammed here, the radiative zone and the convection zone. In the bottom right diagram, we see this, the beginnings of a small foreshadowing of what is going to cause the sun to fail. Because the sun is going through the proton-proton chain, we discussed that in the previous video, the sun is turning hydrogen into helium, and so in the core, and only in the core, we are losing hydrogen. It is becoming helium, but that means that although the entire sun started out at about 75% hydrogen, now the innermost part of the core is maybe only at 30%. Um, going all the way out to the 0.2 or 20% of the core um, size, which we get back to the 75% hydrogen again after that. This tells us that the sun has a finite, what we could call fuel tank, and that fuel tank will eventually run out. The sun is currently middle-aged. It is about 5 billion years old, and it will live for about 5 billion years more but that is something that we'll talk about more in our next module. For now, we want to recognize that those terms, radiative zone and convection zone, have meaning, and we want to make sure we understand them. In the radiative zone, the basic idea is that photons just bring energy outwards by just moving outwards. But it isn't quite that simple. As soon as photons find an atom of any kind, they will be absorbed by that atom and then re-emitted by that atom. It will actually take that photon hundreds of thousands of years, up to a million years, to get from the core of the sun to the surface. So although we think of the sunlight that we're seeing as, you know, fairly fresh light that we're re receiving, those photons were originally sent out by the core 
up to a million years ago. It's kind of weird when you start to think about it. Even the diagram here in part A at the bottom is showing a much more simplified view of the path photons take when it takes tens of thousands, hundreds of, hundreds of thousands of bouncings around for that photon to actually escape the sun. It's worth noting that neutrinos, which also have no mass and are created by the proton-proton chain, they do not get absorbed and re-emitted because they don't interact with that mass. They just leave at the speed of light. We'll be talking about them in just a couple of slides. So the radiative zone is not very effective. At some point, instead of relying on the photons to bounce around and actually get to the surface, convection actually takes over. Where we mentioned this briefly in the previous chapter that that means hot materials coming from low down upwards and then cold materials sinking back down again. This overarching cycle of physical plasma moving up and down again is able to bring heat to the surface, to the photosphere, where it can then freely stream outwards as photons. So the sun has a radiative zone where the photons are carrying the energy out and the convection zone where the plasma is physically moving to bring that heat and energy out. And so we mentioned the neutrinos, let's get back to those. Neutrinos carry about 3% of the overall energy from the proton-proton chain process. They're not useful to us because they don't create light for us, they don't create heat, and so that's kind of lost energy in a sense. However, we want to be able to detect those neutrinos so that we can test to see if those ideas of the proton-proton chain actually match our reality. Science is always trying to test its ideas. We talked about that in back in chapter one. It is actively always part of our discussion. How do we know the things that we know and how are we testing them to make sure they're not wrong? Raymond Davis, shown here on the left, was the first person to desi design a neutrino detector. Keep in mind, this is a particle that not everybody thought even existed and isn't supposed to interact with matter, almost ever. So how do you figure out a way to find them? Once he created the detector, I think there were more questions than answers because the detector, imagine coming to somebody to ask for money to build a giant tank of cleaning fluid in an abandoned gold mine. They would look at you like you're nuts. So that's exactly what Raymond Davis did. He built a huge tank of cleaning fluid because it had a large amount of cheap chlorine atoms in an abandoned gold mine because neutrinos could get through all of the layers of rock above it, but other particles would be blocked by this being underground. So what a great idea. Let's hope it works. And it kind of did. It found about a third of the expected number of neutrinos. Now this is a problem, it's called the solar neutrino problem. The particle physicist suggested what we should see and Raymond Davis and his crew found an observation that didn't match that. We had to figure out if there was something wrong with the hypothesis, something wrong with the idea, or if there was something missing from the experiment. This is a conundrum that we came across uh, once before, and we'll come across several times throughout the semester, when people discovered the orbit of Uranus, the planet Uranus, when we talked about the gravity chapter, it wasn't behaving properly, so we either had to throw out the hypothesis of how gravity works, or figure out what we were missing. In the Uranus example, what we were missing was the planet of Neptune, which was causing its own effects. And in this particular case, what we were missing was that our understanding of neutrinos relied on them being completely without mass. And what this suggested, a possible explanation, is that neutrinos did have mass. If they have enough mass, then they're actually able to change between the three different types of common neutrinos. There are three known types, they're called flavors of neutrinos, and that first experiment was designed to look for the only type that the sun was known to produce or thought to produce. So a way to test this 
explanation would be to build something that could actually find all three types of neutrinos. It took 30 years, but the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory, shown here, was built to do the same kind of thing. Instead of cleaning fluid, which relied on chlorine atoms, it used heavy water, which relies on deuterium existing. And the neutrinos interact with those deuterium atoms within the water molecules. They create a, um, an effect that is then detectable, and everything matched the way it was supposed to. So along the way of this trial and error of the scientific process in action, we learned a whole lot more about neutrinos beyond what we would have learned if we had just started with an, exam uh, an experiment that could measure all three types. So kind of cool. The last small topic from chapter 16 that I want to mention briefly before we end this entire chapter is helioseismology, because one thing you may be questioning, and it's a valid question for you to put forth, is how do we know anything about the inside of the sun if we can't look at it? And although it is a valid question, I could pose that same question back, how do we know about the inside of the earth? Now, geologists helpfully have told us how we figure that out. On Earth, we wait for earthquakes to produce seismic waves, two different types of seismic waves that will interact differently between solids and liquids. And we learn all of this stuff about the Earth's interior, the mantle, the liquid core, the solid outer core or inner core. Stuff we'll talk about in chapter eight at the end of the semester. But on the sun, we don't just wait for earthquakes. The sun is actively always kind of vibrating. Sometimes it's referred to as the breathing of the sun. And it's called helioseismology. Seismology is the study of earthquakes. Helio stands for sun, so it's basically the study of sunquakes. And although the details of this are way outside the scope of the class, there's spherical harmonics involved, a lot of complex math and physics, the basic process is relying on the Doppler effect that we learned about in chapter five. If the sun is visibly breathing, moving towards us, it will be blue shifted. And if the physical material is moving away from us, it will be red shifted. We can pick that movement up the same kind of way that we can do kind of ultrasound type imaging inside the human body because of the Doppler effect. Now, we use the Doppler effect to map these overall vibrations of the sun to figure out how the density changes um, with depth. We can also use it for things like the details of sunspot structure and other things that the book comments on. And it's worth noting that helioseismology is for the sun, but astroseismology, the same process for other stars, is also something that astronomers can do. We won't be talking about it in this class, um, but it's something that's kind of interesting that we can study how stars vibrate to be able to know what the interior structure looks like. Kind of interesting. So we have finished up chapters 15 and 16, the two chapters that focus on our own star, the sun. And in the next set of videos for chapters 17 and 18, we will be talking about the different types of stars that exist and how Although they have some things in common with the sun, there are important differences with different types of stars, and we'll be talking about those important differences. So I will see you in the next chapter.